I affirm the resolution. Funding for STEM education should definitely be prioritized over funding for arts and sports. First off, STEM provides economic benefits. According to the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, IT was responsible for 75% of U.S. productivity growth from 1995 to 2002, and for 44% from 2000 to 2006. It has accounted for 20% of U.S. GDP growth since 1995, despite constituting 4% of U.S. GDP. Over the last two decades, IT made the U.S. economy over $2 trillion larger in terms of annual GDP. Between 2006 and 2010, corporations that invested more in IT increased productivity three times as fast as, corporation that, as corporations that invested less. IT workers contribute three to five times more productivity than non-IT workers. IT purchases generate approximately three times their cost in value for consumers. It's just magnifying any cost that goes into IT. Further, for America, improving achievement in STEM will go a long way to ensuring that our country can globally create jobs and achieve le the levels of economic growth that will buttress American standards of living and social safety net. High quality STEM education represents an opportunity that students, workers, educators, and businesses must seize if we are to keep the country strong. Second off, STEM is necessary for defense in this new world. According to the Governmental Accountability Office, the nation faces an evolving array of cyber-based threats arising from intentional or unintentional uh, problems. Criminal groups, hackers, terrorists, and foreign nations, potential actors, turn the page, can affect computers, software, networks, organizations, an industry, or the internet itself. The magnitude of the threat is compounded by the ever-increasing sophistication of cyber attack techniques. These techniques may target individuals, businesses, critical infrastructures, or government organizations. The threat is heightened by vulnerabilities in federal systems and systems supporting critical infrastructure. GAO has identified vulnerabilities in systems that control physical functions supporting the nation's critical infrastructure. These weaknesses can be exploited by threat actors with potentially severe effects. While billions of dollars are being spent on new technologies to secure the U.S. government in cyberspace, it is the people with the right knowledge, skills, and abilities to implement those technologies who will determine success. There are not enough cybersecurity experts within the federal government or private sector nor is there an adequately established federal cybersecurity career field. Existing cybersecurity training and personnel development programs, while good, are limited in focus and lack unity of effort. In order to effectively ensure our continued technical advantages and future, and future cybersecurity, we must develop a technologically skilled and cyber-savvy workforce and an effective pipeline of future employees. It will take a national strategy similar to the effort to upgrade science and mathematics education in the 1950s to meet this challenge. Now it's time for questions. My question's not yours. Yeah. <laughs> so, where does this funding go? Uh, funding goes to starting off like K through 12, all the way up to incentives at the uh, university. Okay. What is the like specifically like? What does it go into? Like buying new equipment. So yeah, there's like teachers buying new equipment at the K through 12 level. There's subsidies for college students, grants for college students. Uh, various incentives to get involved in STEM and various new ways for younger people to get involved in STEM. Okay, so does everyone in the United States getting involved in STEM significantly improve our standing economically? Uh, significantly improve our standing. It's the people who pursue STEM which are oh, going okay. to be more likely under this increased activity. So you have to have specific people orient, specific people who have this orientation to pursue STEM to be productive? Yeah. Okay. There need to be some people in STEM to get benefits from STEM. And the last question is the sole kind of crux of this debate is that the cuts to arts and sports are necessary in order to achieve this. Yes. Okay. Cool. Now, normally what we would do is uh, I would have some time to prepare my next speech, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to dive right in. All right. <laughs> School districts have canceled art and music programs. They're no longer an integral part of well, holistic learning. In fact, the United States House of Representatives, some members proposed a bill that would cut eight billion from arts fundings. Even though that represents an infinitesimally small portion of the country's budget. Major brain researchers insist that these different 
fields of science and music are actually not that different. They have a known relationship they try to navigate through unexpected situations in search for an unexpected discovery rather than following any preconceived uh, constraints. Out of the box thinking is the new normal today. For example, my dad, he works on the admissions committee for Johns Hopkins the Medical School. And he tells me that the majority of the students that they accept aren't biology majors, chemistry majors, or what you would think. They're art majors, theater majors, music majors, English majors. Why is that? It's not because they, you know, aren't getting good students, so they just have to pick on these guys. I mean, it's Johns Hopkins. I mean, we know it's pretty good. The reason is because it creates a well-rounded environment, and they know what they're doing. Researchers went on to prove that learning to read music and play the piano increased the rate of learning and results in a permanent increase in the learning rate. But if that music learning process stops, the capacity is also halted. Think about it, reading music requires us to look at music notation. It's almost like a cryptography if you want to relate it to computer science. The brain is operating in a challenge and it's trying to be productive at the same time, which is fantastic for the cerebral cortex. In fact, one recent MIT study determined that the cerebral cortex in a concert pianist was 30% bigger than that of supposed intellectual studying at universities. Another California study found that 75% of Silicon Valley CEOs had some form of instrumental music training throughout their grade school. So what is this all looking to? Well, one of the things that Jack talked about in his last speech was that you have to have specific people oriented for the specific uh, tasks. And that this cuts to arts, which is a measly $8 billion when you're comparing it to the national, country's national budget, is really cutting away at what is necessary for us to grow in the STEM field. I mean, cryptography. Cybersecurity, it's a necessary part of national security, as Jack talked about, but it's also necessary for us to be able to decrypt things, like decrypting music on a page. Not to brag or anything, but I won the AP Computer Science Award this year, <laughs> uh, which was funny, uh, because I'm going to college for music next year. I don't think I would do uh, as well in computer science if I could not look at music and be able to decrypt it. There's definitely a correlation there. So the fact that these cuts are necessary is quite the contrary. And that these arts and these things that we're cutting away from are really necessary in order to improve our understanding of science and technology. Jack. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk about how learning instruments gets met better learning in other subjects. Why is this? Okay. Well, one of the major points that uh, this California study uh, looked at was how looking at these abstract symbols on a page uh, and translating them into notations, whether it be fingers on keys for a piano or your own interpretation when you're singing or the way in which you press down on a string on a guitar or a violin, uh, and being able to simultaneously read and comprehend and act at the same time is necessary and is also plays an integral part in such things like coding and cybersecurity where you have to take a message and work with it. Okay, so what this has in common is abstract thought and multitasking? Abstract thought and multitasking, that is inherent in this idea of music and art. Okay, your next example was the, this concert pianist? Pianist, yeah. So, why does his brain being bigger matter? My understanding is that a brain size doesn't lead directly to better brain Well, what function. we're looking at actually is the cerebral cortex, which is actually a really necessary part in comprehensive thinking, and the fact that it's been enlarged and you can see a correlation there between people who have this very high level of comprehensive thinking in the cerebral cortex isn't like a way to disregard the fact that, you know, somebody who is a big person has a bigger brain, but not necessarily smarter. So the cerebral cortex plays a fundamental role in the comprehensive part of thinking. Okay, but why does size matter? Well, <laughs> the fact that he's exercising that enough to the point where the brain and the human body thought that it was necessary to enlarge it because it couldn't comprehend it at the time is significant in comparison to the rest of the brain. Okay. The brain thought it was a good idea okay, cool. now, to enlarge it. So. Okay, I think that's about time. Uh, now I'm going to jump into my next speech. Elliot didn't really answer how STEM funding is way more important at the national level. All he talks about is that there are benefits to STEM when combined with arts. So let's go over what that would mean. If we cut 
STEM in favor of arts, then we're gonna be looking at decreased economic productivity and decreased gains in the long run. What it will get is a few people who are smart, but they're not gonna go into productive, traditionally productive fields. A good example would be Elliot. <laughs> Could be great in computer science. <laughs> but like, Elliot does show a point. We could have geniuses like Elliot, or we could have well, ten to a hundred times as many reasonably intelligent people who we need for these economic benefits and for national security. So going into abstract thinking being like his major benefit, you can gain abstract thinking from cryptography as he, as he says in his own speech. And in that you can get these same benefits from practicing STEM in different ways, it doesn't make any sense why we should prefer arts, especially when STEM, even if you're not getting the super, super great brain power, gets these economic benefits. So, because it's going to make the pie bigger, so arts and sciences get a bigger piece of the pie, even though they're smaller or disproportionate as, as it stands right now. It's gonna be better for both sections to prefer STEM now. So I think you should really prefer STEM. It's good for defense, it's good for the economy. Arts doesn't achieve that. Okay. So one of the things we didn't actually talk about, we only get one opportunity to uh, what we call cross-examine each other, which is where we got the chance to ask each other questions about the topic which is why Jack just ran right, right into his uh, own speech right after I stopped finishing, and which is why I'm going to start right now. So, barring any personal attacks in that last speech. I <laughs> wasn't meant to be personal. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy this uh, idea of this adaptability aspect, uh, which is necessary in this idea of computer science. He said that this idea of you can achieve the same critical and abstract thinking in the STEM field uh, allows you to just kind of bypass these arts and humanities. But why is it that the arts and humanities have played such a significant role? Why is it that people feel invested into these arts and humanities and that they feel like this improves their intelligence? Why do people listen to Mozart when they're studying? I mean, the fact of the matter is, he might be able to achieve some form of abstract thought by just focusing on STEM, but that's not the point. You're looking for adaptability. That adaptability to be able to move, not only from something that is almost a completely different language, to being able to paint something on a page and for you, you to be able to interpret it and for you to be able to send a message is what's really going on here. And the way in which the brain processes that instead of lines of code in which you're just trying to achieve certain things is completely different. It's structure versus chaos. And honestly, if you get thrown into a chaotic situation, which is almost exactly what the defense system is today uh, and all of the government, is that <laughs> you need to be able to be prepared for that. And this chaotic art that we see every day, music that can sometimes make zero sense, or art that we just look at and say, I can paint that, my three-year-old painted that today, just, it's mind-boggling how important that is to be able to understand that. Another thing I'd like to point out is the economic productivity and the economic cost to this. Like I said in the beginning of my speech, it cost a measly $8 billion of funding for arts projects out of the entire country's budgets. Why do we need to cut this and sacrifice the other things? In fact, my question is, why is it necessary for us to provide for these specific STEM researches? Yeah, maybe grants are uh, fine, but to go to college, online degrees are coming up uh, pretty fast. In fact, Mitch, I see you there. We took the AP Computer Science, uh, not the AP Computer Science, the AP Physics C exam, which is calculus-based, and that was a bad choice. But uh, <laughs> we were able to get all of MIT's lectures online. MIT, one of the top colleges, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, all of their physics lectures in order to study for this for free. That idea that I can achieve that without having to spend all this money, whereas with music, in the illustrious words of the choral director here, Dr. Richard Skirpin, he said that music is actually, over the course of the next decade, is gonna be one of the only fields that needs to be personalized. Somebody in a computer screen doesn't know what my voice is like. They don't know how big I am. They don't know what my vocal cords are like. They don't know how I process information. It's a very personal touch. 
You can sit in a lecture hall all day and listen to STEM. In fact, we could do that already. Send everyone to uh, video camps and teach them STEM. But that personal touch of arts is necessary and that costs money. And if we're willing to sacrifice that over this idea of this measly $8 billion to try to improve and send kids to more STEM classes when we really don't need to spend that money, is almost absurd. I might not have a job when I go out of college. Uh, <laughs> uh, I hope you pick up the slap with that mom. Uh, but, uh, but I'll be able to comprehend things more readily, more intuitively than many other people. And that's what we're trying to get to the crux of. What do we need to do? What do, how do we need to raise this generation of students to be productive in the future? I might not be that guy, but the people that are going through these instrumental music programs and the people that are adapting and learning, that's the key. That's what we're both trying to achieve here. But with cuts the arts program, it goes away. And Jack can never achieve the outcome that he's trying to go to. Jumping into the last speech of this whole debate, uh, I'm gonna try to give a good overview and offer my final thoughts. Let's first focus on the economy. As I said in my original speech, the STEM funding can be used to leverage into future gains and into a future uh, economy and into future taxes that can fund even more STEM funding and even more arts funding. What the question we're talking about is, says that it's just one over the other. I'm not saying that I want to get rid of all of arts. I certainly think that there's some benefits there and some good things, but I'm just saying that STEM is better. Funding for STEM is what we should do. So, on to his arguments about the different function, meaning that STEM can achieve this same thought. We have a cybersecurity club here at Blakefield. Um, it did pretty well this year. And it's an understatement. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and what it does is it presents the students with a problem, and they have to think quickly and react to it. This gets into his abstract thinking and reaction time. They're achieving the same thing from art, only they're doing it in a STEM context, and they're doing it in a way that allows them to learn how to code and how to understand computers, things necessary to compete in this technology world. Now, he also talks about MIT Online and how there needs to be this personal touch. The personal touch costs a lot more. Uh, if it takes 100 hours to get wonderful at an instrument, which is not true, right? Does it take 100 hours? No. Yeah. So 100 hours at minimum wage is like a couple hundred bucks, 800 something. But STEM guy, over here. Hmm? STEM guy over here. Yeah. Doing the maths. 800, 875 bucks. So a computer can cost like $100. Internet access for a year costs five. You could buy eight computers, and let's say you can get 10 students per computer. That's 80 students interested in STEM with online resources versus one person getting good at one instrument. This trade-off isn't fair. To have this next generation, we can't focus on one in 80. We have to focus on 80 out of, out of 80, preferably. Uh, but if we allow a few to do well who might not even go into STEM, which is necessary, then we're not going to have a good, a good country in the future. So we need STEM for our economy to get better and to increase faster. We need STEM for our national defense, as there are threats from abroad and also possible domestic threats. To make sure that our country stays safe, secure, and fiscally stable, we need STEM. And if this comes at a cost to art, so be it. That's the debate.